Hello and welcome back to Macroeconomics. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the contraction mapping theorem. This is a very important mathematical result that is going to be important for us to establish that the dynamic programming that we're going to do actually makes mathematical sense. It's important to underline that it's not true that in your career as a macroeconomist you will necessarily be doing lots of real and functional analysis and using the contraction mapping theorem every day unless you become a theorist, of course. Rather, again, it's to make sure that you know that what you are doing makes sense. Just as in the same way as you don't necessarily need to use econometric theory whenever you're estimating something, in the sense of deriving new estimators and such. But it's important to have a very strong foundation in econometric theory to make sure that when you actually run any regressions on Stata or SAS or whatever, that you know that what you're doing makes sense. So let's go ahead and look at the contraction mapping theory. Today we're going to continue talking about the properties of this value function and to do so we're going to find it useful first of all to talk about the properties of this. That's the Bellman operator that we use to try and find the value function itself by repeated iteration. Now, here's some intuition. Notice that, again, we've thought of this initial v here, or v0, however you prefer, as being one of two things. Either it's just some arbitrary continuous view that this agent has about how their future utility will depend on their investment behavior, or last time I thought of a more concrete alternative, which was that maybe V represents the utility of following some particular policy, um, regardless of whether or not it's optimal in the future. So let's take that interpretation for now. And although either way, it doesn't really matter. So take a continuous bounded function V that's arbitrary. And now, um, well, call it V0, and then we can get V1 by applying the Bellman operator once. We can get V2 by applying the Bellman operator twice, and V3, V4, and so on can be generated in a similar fashion. Well, notice that each time there is this number beta here, which in the model is the discount factor, which is less than one. When you think about it, um, whatever influence V0 has on v four five six seven is getting smaller each time because v zero is being put further and further away it's being multiplied by increasing power of beta which is less than one and so if you apply it enough times then the influence of whatever v zero was on what you're going to get is waning so that might give you the intuition that maybe there is something that this sequence v3 before v5 v6 million and so on is actually converging to there's some intuition there and moreover the reason for that is because of beta the discount factor which is less than one so that's a very broad intuition and there's something to it um, however of course it's not so clear that as this agent is optimizing given whatever V0 was at this stage or at this stage or at this stage, that that necessarily is going to converge to the same thing regardless of what V0 was. Um, and that's where we're going to go next. What we're going to do is look at a kind of function that's called a contraction mapping. And a contraction mapping is the following. First of all, we need to start with some space of numbers or functions or whatever. And we need that in that space, there is a distance function, I'm just gonna call it rho. So we have a space in which it is meaningful to measure distances between things. We already looked at a few examples. And let's consider a function t 
that maps from the space S into itself. Okay. Now, this function T is defined as a contraction mapping if there is some number beta, you get that the distance between, um, let's say, any two points x and y is always going to be greater than or equal to the distance Sorry about that. The distance between the function applied to x and the function applied to y. In other words, you can think of a contraction mapping as something that kind of squeezes things together. Closer and closer, that is. Also, it's not that important, but you can also in addition, say that this number beta, sorry, beta, I forgot to mention, has to be between zero and one. Notice the analogy with the discount factor. And in addition, this beta is something that we can refer to as a modulus, though we won't need that that much. Now, the next thing we want to see is what's called the contraction mapping theorem. And this theorem states that suppose that our space and its distance function together form a complete metric space should remember from before what a complete space means in this context. It means that all Cauchy sequences have a limit, converge to a limit. So suppose we have this, and also suppose we have some T, um, like the one we just had that maps from S into itself. Uh, um, suppose that T is a contraction mapping with modulus beta. Then T, sorry, has exactly one fixed point. It has one and only one fixed point in the space. And in addition, for any v0, if we call this fixed point v, for any v0 in this space, the distance between our contraction mapping applied multiple times to our starting point V0, the distance between that and the fixed point is going to be less than, sorry, less than or equal to beta to the power of n times the distance between v0 and the fixed point for any n in the natural numbers. So 
what is this telling us? It's telling us that if we have a contraction mapping and we have a space where everything, every Cauchy sequence converges and has a limit, then this contraction mapping, which is a mapping that squeezes things closer together, has exactly one and only one fixed point, one point that stays the same when you apply the mapping. And moreover, this modulus thing actually turns out to play a useful role here because it's telling us something about how quickly we're getting, it's putting a bound, I guess, on how slowly we are converging towards this fixed point V. How is this going to apply in our context? Well, very briefly, what happens is, should be quite clear because of the way I've used the notation. Um, v, in our case, the value function, lives in the space of bounded continuous functions. And we discussed before that the space of bounded continuous functions is complete. Um, when we're defining distance in the way we discussed before, which is using the soup norm. Now, as a result, any contraction mapping is going to have one fixed point in that space, and we will be able to converge to it by repeated application of a contraction mapping from any starting point. What is the contraction mapping? The contraction mapping in this context is B, the Bellman operator itself. Why is the Bellman operator something that makes, that squeezes uh, points in this function space closer together? It's clearly because of beta, it's because of the discounting. Now, to get some intuition for how this contraction mapping theorem works, let's consider a very simple case. Let this be x, and let's define our space s as being the interval between two real numbers a and b. So then this is a, this is b, this is a, and this is b. Great. And of course, that means that this, sorry, is more or less, if I can get this right, the 45 degree line. That's better. Um, so a fixed point of a function in this space is going to be a point on the 45 degree line. The question then is what is going to be a contraction mapping in this context? The contraction mapping here is gonna be one that if we take any two points in our interval, let's say this point and this point, we apply our function t, we have to get two numbers that are closer together. In other words, whatever value there is here, the vertical distance between, so this is, let's say, um, x and y, this is t of x, t of y has to be well, somewhere above, well, not this, what we know is that it cannot be a greater distance above t of x than the difference between x and y. In other words, what does it mean? It's the same as saying that the slope of this function has to be strictly less than one. In fact, it has to be strictly less than whatever the modulus beta is of our contraction mapping t. So what's a contraction mapping in the interval AB? It's some line that has slope less than one, strictly less than one, bounded away from one, strictly bounded away from one, by the way. So 
our t must be some function that has a strictly less than one slope. And of course, if it has a strictly less than one slope, it has to cross the 45 degree line at one point. And after it's crossed it, it can never get back to it because its slope is bounded away from one. So that's hopefully some intuition for how this contraction mapping theorem works. Returning to our value function and our Bellman operator, by analogy, it doesn't actually matter where you start with V0. By repeated application of the Bellman operator, we're going to eventually converge to our unique fixed points. And the reason is because the Bellman operator is a contraction mapping. A little later on, we'll discuss some conditions under which um, this Bellman operator is going to be a contraction mapping. That's a little more precise of a statement because I could write down some nonsense here and it wouldn't necessarily make sense anymore. Um, but basically what it's gonna come down to is things like this production function should be concave. This utility function should be concave. And again, concavity of utility functions and production functions are very common features of economic models. And so in general, that means that we are going to be in the clear. 